My name is Mikey Mahenna. I'm the ED of Afika, and I'm excited to be uh, joined by two special guests, Malik Rasamni, who's going to be co-hosting and moderating uh, today's interview entirely, actually not co-hosting, uh, hosting today's interview. I'll just be doing our intro, and Yasser Munif, who I'll introduce in a second as well. Uh, I will introduce our special host, Malik Rasamni, is a researcher, a filmmaker based between Beirut and Paris. His works include the film Space of Exception and Indian Winter and the multimedia project The Native and the Refugee. And importantly for this talk, uh, Malik has been involved with Afikra since 2014 and it's an honor that he is hosting today's interview. Our special guest is Yasser Munif. He's a sociology associate professor in the Institute for Liberal Arts at Emerson College. He's the co-founder of the Global Campaign for Solidarity with the Syrian, uh, uh, for, with the Syrian Revolution. He's the author of The Syrian Revolution Between the Politics of Life and the Geopolitics of Death. He also teaches courses on race relations, urban sociology, nationalism, political economy, and Middle Eastern politics and society. He specializes in colonial history, racial identities, and the production of post-colonial space in marginal sites in France and its colonial territories. There's a lot more to that, but with that, I will pass it over to Malik and um, you guys can take it away. Thank, Thank you, you Mikey. Mikey. Thank you. It's really an honor to be here. I'm, I'm a huge fan of both Afikra and Yasser Munif. So uh, to be here, uh, uh, having a conversation with Professor Munif on behalf of Afikra is really, uh, for me, a dream come true. Um, I'd like to start this conversation, I'd like to focus the majority of this conversation on uh, Yasser's book that Mikey just mentioned, The Syrian Revolution uh, Between the Politics of Life and the Geopolitics of Death. Um, but before we do that, I would like to kind of uh, start from the beginning, as it were, and talk about uh, Professor Munif's father, uh, Abdul Rahman Munif. Abdul Rahman Munif is, of course, uh, one of the most important, I think, uh, Arabic uh, authors, or authors in general, really, of the uh, late 20th century, uh, comes from the uh, Arabian Peninsula and um, was for a long, long time uh, working in was in Iraq, he was a minister in the government, and then he had a uh, falling out with the regime of Saddam Hussein, moved to Syria, and uh, wrote many, many books. Uh, unfortunately, not, not enough of them have been translated into English, but one of the most important books, or one of the most famous books that he wrote is, of course, the book Cities of Salt, which is part of a larger series and details the transformation um, of a Bedouin uh, community in, uh, in what is today Saudi Arabia as oil is discovered. So as, as petroleum is discovered and as um, you know, infrastructure is built and money enters the town, the, he, he kind of in this very epic manner charts the changes across the community that are a result of the oil economy. And I think he is one of the most biting uh, critics of both um, the neoliberal developments associated with the uh, oil boom, as well as the nature of um, various uh, Arab regimes uh, and I and I think uh, well, I'm curious, Professor. Uh, like, how how did having uh, how did uh, your father's legacy, his way of thinking, influence you? How do you respond to it? Uh, how did it shape you? What are you reacting to against? But not only his work and his way of thought, but also the lifestyle that he lived, because you had the opportunity to live in several different Arab countries with a prominent uh, social and political critic. Right, so you you grew up. Uh, you're from. Yeah, you you grew up. I think partially in Iraq, partially in Syria. Later on, you you went and you continued uh, uh, your work in, um, in undergraduate studies in Paris. So you you've had this ability to kind of look at different Arab regimes, both from the inside out, which I think is quite unique. So I'm wondering if how does that early childhood and your father's uh, way of thinking kind of affect you? Thank you, thank you, Malik, for this very generous uh, introduction, and thank you to Mikey and uh, the whole uh, Africa team for for organizing this and inviting me. And thank you for um, the uh, attendance. I'm recognizing some some of you, Radwan here, and, and others, um, and I'm happy you're uh, you're here. Um, yeah, the the impact and the influence of my father uh, on on me was was tremendous. And as you said, uh, he was really a diasporic figure. Um, couldn't stay for too long in one country because there was always constantly pressure on on him to to move elsewhere uh, because of his political involvement, because of his writing, because of 
the numerous uh, open letters that he wrote against uh, the various Arab dictators. And, um, and there is a, a very small democratic spaces in, in the Arab world. So we were constantly moving from one country to another, constantly losing our passport um, just for the elected. I was born Algerian and then became Iraqi and later uh, lost the Iraqi passport to get the Yemeni and finally got the Syrian. Uh, and I didn't get citizenship on, up until a few years before the uprising because uh, my mother is Syrian, but uh, the law didn't really um, uh, allow for, for kids to, to get their uh, mother's um, citizenship. So, so I was also diasporic and moving uh, from one place to another and feeling the pressure. Um, oftentimes, uh, you know, there were articles about um, he has been killed or there are attempts of, for um, assassinations. Uh, and even with his books, he wrote about uh, the Arab prisons and um, a book uh, titled Ashraq uh, Mutawassit the uh, east of the Mediterranean. And so where we, when we were in Iraq, um, the people close to the government would say, oh, this is a book about prisons in Syria, right? And when we moved to Syria, uh, they were saying the same thing. This is a book about uh, Iraqi prisons, right? And so you had to navigate those spaces and, uh, and that was very impactful. I mean, the idea of not feeling, you know, as, as a national um, within the, uh, modern uh, borders of Sais Pico, Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon, uh, that was very helpful to not be confined by those narrow borders and feeling that you are part of the larger, you know, Arab speaking world, uh, diasporic, attached to multiple identity, diversity. Uh, and his work on prison was very, very impactful. Um, I've been more recently researching prisons in, in the Arab world, involved in abolitionist work uh, with the prison uh, coalition here, in the US and, and elsewhere. Um, so his, his impact was tremendous. Yeah, it seems he really represented, I mean, it's interesting what you were saying, this idea of not being confined to one country and not, not being in a way, growing up within the realm of Sykes-Pico or within the forced imaginary of, of, of Sykes-Pico and actually being able to look at it from a larger vantage point. But then of course there's a price to be paid. And so there's, it's both, it's both a privilege, but then there's also, it's, it's something that's forced. And that's the figure of, the, you know, I think the Arab, the figure of the Arab in exile, which we've all experienced to varying degrees. But I think it's interesting in your case, these exiles occurred in the Arab world, where for a lot of us, the exiles from the country we are from, you know, towards the West, in my case, you know, the United States. Um, well, I would like to continue now and uh, talk before we, uh, I want to introduce several of the essays that you, uh, that you worked on. But before I do, I want to talk about, uh, the uh, the work you did uh, when you were pursuing your undergraduate studies in Paris, because it's not uh, quite as related to the uh, you know to the book as some of the other uh, essays. When can we have the uh, the next slide? Yes, uh, French postcolonial nationalism and Afro-French uh, subjectivities. You were dealing with kind of the construction of uh, urban spaces. Uh, in, in, in Paris at the time and its relationship to colonial geographies, if I'm not mistaken. Is that something you can elaborate on before we... I'm less familiar with that work, honestly. I'm more familiar with your work on Syria and on, and on the Arab Spring. But before we dive into that, since it's not as deeply related, I would be curious to know more about that, that work because it's interesting in its, uh, in its own right. So yeah, that was my, my dissertation. And as I was um, developing a topic for my dissertation in 2005, 2006, there was an urban uprising in, in France, in Paris. And there was a state of, uh, of um, exception or siege in, in France for 17 years. People couldn't go out um, you know, accord, uh, um, on, on certain hours. And, uh, and the post-colonial population, the black and brown, people who often live in the suburbs, the poor working class suburbs, uh, were the target of those uh, exceptional policies that weren't implemented in more than six years. Uh, the last time they were in place was during the colonial period when uh, France was uh, still in, in Algeria. 
And so I was interested in understanding better the, the French uprising and uh, the spectacular way that it was covered in the US. You know, you have the Islamophobia in the uh, Western media, the mainstream media, and the way that it was covered in the US was not satisfying. And that's why I decided to do uh, work in, in France. So I stayed for two years and I tried to understand the impact of space. Uh, and what's interesting with uh, those spaces is oftentimes the uh, the architects and the urban planners and the policymakers who um, really erected those spaces in, in the suburbs were very influential in the colonies. And oftentimes they brought designs and uh, architecture from the colonies that were perfected and were implemented to subjugate the colonial population in different uh, um, African and Asian countries, and they were brought back initially to subjugate and dominate the working classes, the white working classes in France, and later on, some of those designs, uh, architectural and urban, were um, maintained to uh, to police the Arab and and black uh, uh, and black population. So it's a dissertation that's really interested in the ways that space operate to shape identities and subjugate people, and make sure that they navigate the space in a certain way. Um, I think that this is a really uh, fascinating topic, the way that the city, the urban, operate uh, to shape our identities, to force us to behave in certain ways, to think in certain ways, to adopt certain identities as opposed to others. Uh, and space has, um, is very powerful in, in, that, um, in that regard, and I think understudy. So, so that's what I did, uh, and um, it was the, the project that I studied was uh, the most expensive uh, project in, in Europe at that time. I think it was around $500 million. And uh, the in, they had the in, an incentive to completely um, redesign the, uh, the, the space to prevent future uprisings or revolts. Um, and, and you see some of that here in the US with the way that architects and urban planners are involved in planning spaces, black and brown spaces, to make sure that they are obedient, they are docile, that they don't, you know, uh, uh, revolt against um, the power elite or the powerful. Well, I have to take back what I said when I said that your research was less related because these themes come up very strongly in the second chapter of your book on Aleppo, when you talk about urban warfare in Aleppo and the way the uh, Assad regime utilized the urban and sectarian um, and geographic divisions of the city during the, during the uprising and the war. It's a riveting uh, part of the book. And I think this just goes to show how um, broad Professor uh, Monif's interests are. I mean, they range everything from class relations to urban geography, to theories of nationalism, to theories of micro-political processes. And the way that you're able to bring these uh, different topics all together and synthesize them into a coherent framework, I think is remarkable. And I think that gets to the heart of what the Syrian revolution is about. Um, which I, I would like to talk about. Before we go and dive straight into the book, I want to quickly pass over three essays uh, that you wrote um, that kind of laid the groundwork for what you later on um, cover. And you have the, the, the essay about the Arab revolts, the old is dying and the new uh, cannot be born, which uh, kind of deals with the concept of uh, hegemony in the, in the Arab uprising and uh, kind of how the historical, uh, neo the, the, the ruling class kind of experienced a crisis at, at the moment before the Arab Spring that made the revolution possible. And we can certainly see this in Syria with the neoliberal crisis that really accelerated under uh, Bashar al-Assad. You also have another uh, chapter, another uh, uh, paper that should be on the next, um, on the next side, yes. This was a great uh, the participatory democracy and micropolitics in Menbij, which really is based on field work that you did uh, in Menbij uh, right before uh, in 2013 at a very specific moment in Menbij's history when it had been freed from the forces of the government, but prior uh, to the cementing of control by, uh, by ISIS. And I mean, for me, that was one of the most riveting essays I saw because it really shows you what happens at the moment of total revolution which is something that very few people realize. I think, I think a lot of the problem with the Arab Spring and how people have uh, understood it is that people, especially in the West, think that revolution is this theological process wherein we have an idea, we implement it. 
Whereas uh, in order for that to happen, you need a kind of power elite that can go ahead and implement uh, that. And I think that's the major difference between the Arab Spring and the coups, the series of coups that happened. And you also talk about this, the series of coups that happened in Egypt with Jamal Abdel Nasser, the Free Officers coup, or uh, the Ba'ath coups in Iraq and in Syria in the late 60s or the uh, late 50s, early 60s. Those, those uh, the, the kind of, there was a kind of uh, program that was implemented. Whereas in the Arab Spring, there was a genuine experimental process wherein people were experimenting and attempting to create uh, on the ground new forms of life, new ways of, of organizing, uh, new forms of, of power relations, especially in Syria, I think that was very key with the collapse of uh, government control in many parts of Syria and, and, and the coordination committees that arose to kind of manage daily life. And I think in the West, people interpret that as so much noise. You know, it, it, they, didn't, they couldn't read, they didn't have the language to read what was happening uh, politically. And um, I think that, that illegibility, as well as um, the Islamic cultural references of many Syrians, how that fed into the kind of Islamophobic predisposition that people carry both within the Arab world and without. I mean, it's not, uh, Islamophobia also exists within Arab societies, I think. But in Arab societies, I think Islamophobia is very tied to class uh, more than it might be in, in the West. So, and so these kinds of, these kinds of, uh, these kinds of, uh, sorry, I got, yes, the, 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 the illegibility of the, revo uh, of the revolutions and the revolutionary struggles made it hard for people to understand what was going on and, and people, as a result, solidarity was missing. And so that's why you speak about the politics of life as something that's being constructed really from a grassroots point of view uh, versus a geopolitics of death. I think what also uh, plays into that is also that it's, it's easier for us to read national politics. Russia did this. China does that, America does that, then it is for us to read what's happening internal inside countries. And you cannot understand, even though the Arab Spring is a pan-regional phenomenon, it is also deeply local. It, 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 you really have to understand each country and the localities within each country in order to understand what's going on. And, and in many Arab countries, we don't even know our own countries, right? I mean, in Syria, many, many Syrians remarked that they had never really knew, known much about Raqqa or uh, Deir zur or even Homs or other cities prior to the revolution. It's the same thing in Lebanon. With the Lebanese revolution, people discovered Tripoli, even though it's the second biggest city in, in Lebanon and historically was the biggest actually. Um, so I'd like to move to the book itself, if we can, uh, right. So you, you break your uh, book down into five chapters, Necropolitics, the Taxonomies of Death in Syria, the Geography of Death in Aleppo, which is what we talked about with urban space. But I'd like to start with, um, this idea, you so you frame there's the politics of life and the geopolitics of death. Let's start with the politics of life. Where, where is the politics of life uh, in Syria and how did it express itself in, in oftentimes contradictory ways? Because um, you've done, you did actual field work there and you, and you were there at a crucial point. So you take the example of Menbij in particular as a laboratory wherein new processes of, of, of politics were being created on the ground in the worst of scenarios. So maybe you can share with us more about that and, and how not only what you researched through your firsthand experience, but then how you were able to use post-colonial theory um, to help yourself conceptualize what was going on and make these two things touch base and interact. Yeah, um, so I will start with the, uh, the title of the book, uh, the politics of, or the subtitle of the book, The Politics of Life and the Geopolitics of Death. There is a massive literature on revolutions. Um, there are countless books that have been written about the French Revolution and Russian Revolution and Haitian Revolution and the Paris Commune and uh, the, the um, Spain, Spanish Revolution. But uh, oftentimes those frameworks that have been developed to study and understand those various revolution are not easily transposable to different uh, situation. And so you cannot say, Oh, I'm going to, you know, bring what, whatever people developed as, as theoretical tools or as concepts or as theories to understand the, uh, the Russian Revolution to try to understand the Syrian Revolution. And so it's a really a heuristic, uh, heuristic um, uh, process. Um, it's a lot of trial and error. Uh, this book is not trying to propose you know, a, a polished theory to understand the Syrian revolution. It's more a type of experimentation. 
because the revolutionary process is really messy. I mean, when you go to Syria and witness what people are doing, someone with, uh, someone described what's happening in Syria is the um, the country with a thousand uh, village republics. Every village, every city was, you know, had its own logic, was operating on a different ground, had different forces, um, and were uh, either successful or less successful, either, you know, democratic or, or less democratic. Some of them were able to resolve some of the issues, others were not, uh, for various reasons, historical, but also, um, you know, the way that the, the, the demographics of the city or the, the village, there are many factors that played into, um, you know, what, um, what the revolution produced in those different uh, locations. And so what I'm proposing in this book is to push against a lot of the literature try to understand uh, uh, the revolution and the Arab revolution through that framework of, of geopolitics. You know, who is backing whom? Where does China stand on this? Uh, what is the position of Russia on that? Uh, did uh, the US you know, sell uh, weapons or back some of the militias or not? And I think this is very reductive to try to reduce and limit our understanding of Arab revolution, whether in Egypt or in Tunisia or in Syria or mm -hmm. elsewhere, to uh, proxy wars between superpowers or regional powers. And I think it leads to either a misunderstanding or uh, and also participate in undermining the revolution process. And instead, what I'm proposing in, in this book is to try to understand the revolution process from the ground up to see what people are doing. And therefore, it's always a perspectival um, you know, study. You cannot, I think, uh, it's, it's gonna take a lot of time to really understand what happened in Syria. Once we have you know, countless studies of the different localities, so Aleppo and Hama and uh, uh, Raqqa and um, Damascus and the, the suburbs of Damascus, and oftentimes you had different processes operating in different ways and, and two juxtaposing uh, uh, neighborhood. Uh, you know, just to uh, give you an anecdote, the people who were in front of a square or the uh, um, uh, mosque in Damascus and could see the snipers killing the protesters and people getting out of the mosque, because that was oftentimes people would gather in the mosque, whether they are Christian or Muslims or Shia, whether they believed in God or not, whether they were communists or socialists, they gathered in the mosque because that's the only non-lethal space in, in Syria in the early um, phase of the revolution. And after the prayer, uh, and I did that and I don't pray and I'm not religious, I went to the mosque and after the, 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 the prayer, you go out and you start the, 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 the protest. Uh, but there are oftentimes snipers, there are thugs, there are the Shabiha who killed many people. And so those people who are in the neighborhood facing the mosque and had balconies and could see the violence of the regime very quickly um, they, you know, they, they were allied to, to the uh, revolution uh, and the way they, they started supporting the revolutionary. And oftentimes, you know, in the old Damascus, you have, uh, it's a labyrinth and it's very easy to end up in a street without end and, and be caught by the, the security. And oftentimes, you know, you had people, strangers opening their doors and letting the, the protesters to get in, hiding them. Um, Whereas people who didn't have that access and couldn't see what the regime was, was doing and were relying on the, the, the Syrian regime media and uh, you know, other, um, other uh, such media uh, didn't really support the revolution. So, I mean, that's an anecdote, but there are countless other ways uh, to describe the, the process and how local oftentimes it, it is. And so I was very interested in understanding the messiness of the revolution process and trying to understand what's happening at the local level and try to produce work at that very local level. So my study, for example, about Aleppo is about Aleppo. You can't transpose what happened in Aleppo to try to understand the revolution process or the counter-revolution process in Damascus or, or elsewhere. Because um, my, the study, the chapter about, about Aleppo required a long you know, uh, uh, understanding of, his, uh, of the urban history of Aleppo and the different neighborhood and who lives in them and their alliances with and where the checkpoints are and where the thugs are. And, um, you know, the uh, even the um, the uh, where there is like, uh, you know, the the, the leveling of, of the city, uh, the high points and the, the low points of where the, the snipers are, are located. So you can't really transpose uh, such an urban study to another place. And this is true for for other aspects of, of the revolution. That's a very local uh, process. And, and we need to understand it from that perspective 
and oppose it to the geopolitics, what I'm calling the geopolitics of death, because that uh, perspective, that kind of methodology, trying to understand the revolution from a geopolitical standpoint, um, you know, the relationship between different nations and state and their interests, erases the revolution. It, uh, it prevents the revolution from, you know, being visible. Uh, because obviously France and the US are not interested in whether the revolution succeed or not. They're interested in, in maintaining their interest in, in, in the region. And that's true for every, every single state. I mean, that's by definition what the state is, furthering their own interest. Uh, and so if you know, some revolutionary uh, groups support the state, they will back them. And if not, they will uh, undermine them. Um, so I think it's um, a study, a geopolitical study, is very detrimental to our understanding of a revolution. Absolutely, and I think I mean these these geopolitical frameworks are so hard for people to break out of because they um, are so convenient, and it's just a kind of vocabulary that people so easily fall into, even on the left, who should know better. And I think, especially in a time of a revolution, it's precisely when geopolitics doesn't serve doesn't serve the case because you're dealing with revolutions internal to a society. Um, you speak about, in the book, about death, I mean, about the state, excuse me, as in its worst manifestation, a kind of behemoth of death. I mean, the state is this oppressive mechanism. And in many ways, the Assad regime is, is the climax, right, of, of, of that idea of the state as sheer uh, brutal force even in its, uh, with, with, shorn of all ideology, because the Assad regime is chameleon-like when it comes to its ideology. It can be anything for anyone. It wears different ideologies at its convenience. Uh, and can you speak more about the counter-revolution? The, 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 unfortunately, we have to bring it up. Can you speak more about, you know, your first chapter is necropolitics, the taxonomies of death, uh, where you, and I think it's the longest chapter, maybe uh, one of the longer chapters in the book. Can you speak about the way that the, uh, the government in Syria, and this is also applicable to other, other governments in the Middle East, uh, utilized, uh, strategically kind of uh, utilized, created a kind of a chaos or strategically used the country against itself in order to create this, what you speak about in, your, in the previous essay, this Manichaean uh, kind of struggle, this kind of either or scenario where it's either some sort of ISIS Islamist uh, hell or uh, or Assad, right? It's either, and that's and and that unfortunately has the the ability of both scaring Syrians and then also scaring the West. So can you talk more about the strategies of counter revolution and how they they work not just physically but also conceptually in creating this Manichaean image of the revolution that ig ignores or reformulates this this messy politics of life that you talk about. So oftentimes um, people who are uh, who are uh, opposed to the Syrian revolution or other revolution will say, if people will, uh, you know, avoid violence, if they are peaceful, if they just participate in peaceful demonstration, then everything is fine, and um, and you know we can we can back them, we can show solidarity with them. We have to understand that the history of violence in Syria is very long. That Assad came after twenty two coup in 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 Syria. Um, the first one was organized by the CIA in 49, and there were 21 after that. And so Assad wanted to build a coup-proof uh, state or regime. And in, he did that through a military prison uh, industrial complex. Uh, the prison institution is an extremely important total institution. Uh, it really gives the, the rhythm or the tempo of, of the Syrian uh, society. Um, it produced the kingdom of silence, as uh, Riyadh Turk would uh, would say. Uh, it prevent people from participating and engaging in, in politics. It erased any political spaces in, in Syria. And so if we want to understand the violence in 2011, I think we have to connect it with the long history of violence in, in Syria and the suppression of any opposition, uh, no matter where, where it came from. So for example, there was a very strong and important um, labor movement uh, in, in Syria. And, and people wanted to use their um, workplace as a way to participate in the political process because they knew, you know, you can't uh, really join political parties and, and that the uh, workplace might be, uh, you know, an option to, um, 
to create a more participatory and autonomous and democratic workplace where you decide and you don't get the decision from, from the top. And those unions were completely cr uh, crushed in 1980, 80, 82. Uh, and, uh, and instead, the Syrian regime put Basis in, in place. And he erased any other oppositional spaces in, in Syria. And so what happened in 2011 is the Syrian regime really using this toolbox that it created in the past 30 years of uh, suppressing any opposition of, uh, you know, torturing people who were opposed to the Assad uh, regime or policies of exiling people who were, um, who wanted to be more um, uh, engaged in, in politics. Uh, and so what you see is the very astute uh, use of, of violence by the Syrian regime. You know, from afar, it seems that it is chaotic. It's just, um, you know, uh, 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 it doesn't have any kind of logic, but if you look closely, uh, every form of violence that was used to th since 2011 has a logic. And so, and sometimes it's uh, it's random. You feel uh, that there were a campaign of um, you know uh, dropping barrel bombs that are you know dumb bombs in a, in a certain way to uh, to eradicate some neighborhoods in an airport. There are also very precise snipers who try to target uh, specific. Um, activists or, or organizers. And so you have all sorts of, um, of, of deaths that were implemented. Sometimes it's collective punishment of, a of an entire neighborhood where you don't have um, access to food or medication, where uh, the medical uh, equipment and supplies are, are destroyed. And sometimes it's the punishment of one single body when they are tortured in, in uh, Sadnaya prison and, and elsewhere. So I was interested in trying to make sense of that violence and try to understand the logic behind that violence instead of putting all sorts of violence in the same box and you know, not, not um, uh, making a, or understanding the, the consequences of each one of those uh, forms of, of violence. And what you see is you know, a very precise and um, interesting implementation of, of violence um, that took place in, in various uh, locations in, in Syria. That's what I tried to do in, in that first chapter. And obviously the prison uh, industrial complex or the prison system in Syria is a central component in, in that. The way that the Syrian regime used prisons, uh, oftentimes uh, the activists and the people who were taking pictures and filming and uploading on YouTube were tortured and killed and they were targeted much more than the fighters who were um, you know, fighting the Syrian regime with violence, with, uh, with weapons, because the Syrian regime understood the importance of the media and of journalism. And, uh, and, um, and so those people needed to be suppressed. And so I think it's very important to understand the form of violence instead of you know, putting all that violence under one, um, one label. Um, so that's what, what I've done in that chapter. All right. Uh, I wonder if I have time for one more question or if we should move to the Afikra questions. I would have one more question before we do that. Uh, briefly, uh, Professor, I'm, I'm curious specifically about, uh, you know, you speak about the importance of understanding local developments and then putting that together to form a larger picture. Uh, what were some of the lessons that you learned? What were some of the things just on a personal level as an activist and as a, as a thinker that surprised you in your time in Manbij? What what were some of the things that you were surprised, some of the things about revolution that you had believed before that you came to understand in a different light, having seen this on the ground? What were some of the mistakes made by the revolutionaries? What were some of the challenges they faced? Just to understand um, what are some of the challenges posed at the moment of total revolution or total state collapse, uh, in, in, and specifically in this case in Syria. So I'm interested in how you would think of it as, as a revolutionary, as a Syrian, as a thinker, uh, just some, some of the things that struck you. So the, the bureaucratic sector in Syria is very large. And uh, when the Syrian regime removed the state employees from one city because it was taken over by the revolutionary, by, uh, by the opposition, um, what it, uh, the Syrian state wanted to, to do was to completely uh, you know, get the, the, the city or the village to, to collapse. Um, because it's not necessarily easy to operate you know, the water supply and electricity and phone and gather or collect the, the garbage, um, distribute bread and, and, and so on. 
And so what I witnessed was, you know, how people, communities on the ground were able to solve those, uh, those problems. And uh, it's fascinating. I think it was spectacular. As we celebrate the 150th anniversary of the French Commune, I can't help but see the parallels between uh, that in Paris in, 19, in 1871 and what happened in, in different um, villages and, and cities in, in Syria. And it's, um, it's really interesting how people were able to build an infrastructure to make um, you know, life um, or, or the city livable, um, you know, to provide all these uh, necessities to the population. And remember that the Syrian regime was also pushing a lot of the refugees from the areas that it controlled to the liberated areas to burden those cities. Manbij is one of those places where uh, the refugee population was almost uh, equal to the uh, to the uh, resident of, of the city. And that's, that's a heavy, very heavy burden because oftentimes the infrastructure of the city doesn't allow to provide for that, um, that very large number. And, and yet people were able to implement really creative uh, techniques and strategies to make those cities livable. Um, and they did a number of different things. But the more, most interesting, I think, are the democratic spaces where you see uh, old Ba'ath members and uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, members and people from the Communist Party and socialists and secular and pious people all getting together on a weekly basis and uh, discussing, you know, matters that are important to their city or village, and those discussions oftentimes start, you know, at eight or nine p.m. and end at two or three o'clock in the morning, and they are fascinating discussions. Um, so I think that we can learn a lot from what happened in Syria and the Arab region in general if we are able to get rid of our Orientalism and our Islamophobia and our way of seeing those regions are lesser than whatever happens in, in Europe. Uh, I mean, the way that this, the Paris Commune or the Spanish Revolution are celebrated and written about is just, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's upsetting to see uh, in the ways um, that, um, you know, on the other hand, the Syrian revolution and other similar revolution, Yemen and so on, are tarnished and are suppressed and are, are perceived as, as lesser or as just counter-revolutionary, as sectarian, as extremist, uh, when I think there are many, many lessons that we can uh, draw from, from those revolutionary processes. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we could have a whole conversation about Orientalism and the various discourses that have prevented people from, from seeing what has been going on. But for now, I'd like to jump into a transition slightly into a quick uh, Q&A before we open it up to the audience. Uh, Professor, what are you reading or watching right now? Any series, books? So I, I teach a lot of courses on, uh, on race and racism and the history of racism in the US. And so I'm currently uh, reading Black Marxism by Cedric Robinson, which I recommend. It's a fascinating book from 1983, but many people are rereading it right now. Um, he coined the concept of racial capitalism. I think it's a very important book to really understand the connections between racism and, and capitalism. And I'm also reading um, uh, The Blood in My Eye by George Jackson, a very important political prisoner in the US who was assassinated by the, uh, by, by the police um, as part of the Ithaca uh, rebellion, the prison rebellion in, seven, in 1971. And, and this year we are, we are actually celebrating or um, commemorating the 50th anniversary of that prison rebellion. And oftentimes this is a place that is under, uh, understudied. The prison is a place where I think we could uh, learn a lot. Uh, and he wrote the book in that context. Um, his understanding of the oppression in prison and the oppression as a black body, as a black person. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more about the idea of the prison as a site of potential resistance and a site to really examine the state, to really see where the state is active at its most clear form, both in the US and in the Middle East, absolutely. Okay, so who would you love to shadow for a day, past or present? Who would you like to follow around? That's, that's a hard question. Um, you know, I, uh, I'm also interested in the Spanish Revolution, and um, but re recently um, I've been reading George Orwell, uh, book on the Spanish Revolution. And it's a fascinating book because you see the discussion that were taking place among revolutionaries 
uh, and uh, the ways that they were strategizing against against fascism in uh, in uh, in Spain, and um, and you know dreaming about a different world and about um, a more you know egalitarian world, and so uh, the book is fascinating. I would love to shadow uh, Orwell during that period uh, where he was um, witnessing that revolution process in Spain in uh, 1936 to 38. It's a great answer. Uh, the third is, so what do people most misunderstand about your work? I think it's the main idea of the book. Um, when I was in Beirut, uh, I, I, was, uh, I organized a protest about uh, the war in Iraq. And uh, the main sign was no to Arab dictators and no to imperialism or war. And um, for those who recall, uh, the Arab street or the Arab people were really split. Uh, those who supported the war because they saw it as a way to democratize Iraq and that the US is coming to, to Iraq to democratize. Um, and those who supported uh, Saddam because uh, he was um, pushing back against imperialism in the region. And so I think we need to avoid those binaries. And oftentimes my, my work is understood as such. Uh, if you support, if you are against Arab dictators, then by definition, you must be visiting the Western embassies every week uh, in <laughs> Lebanon or whatever. Wow. And if you are opposed to uh, the imperialism or Western uh, powers, and therefore you are you know, consequently an ally to a uh, regime that are perceived oppositional to the Western uh, regime, such as Iran or Syria or Saddam back then and, and so on. Uh, and I think we need to go beyond those, those binary, those you know, simplistic dichotomy. And we need to oppose both as a starting point to have any meaningful discussion. Absolutely, and that, that, that became clear to me in the aftermath of the Arab Spring, that, that, that need for the third space. Um, the final one is whose work do you admire and are inspired by? imagine that, that there's a lot there. I have to say Fanon, and I think that we have to engage with Fanon much more, especially in the context right. of the Arab revolts. Uh, mm. Fanon is an extremely important figure. And also Rosa Luxemburg, because Rosa Luxemburg uh, was always um, an intellectual, but also an activist and an orga organizer. And she was assassinated in 1919 as part of her struggle against uh, the mounting fascist uh, movement in, in Germany. Um, and so she, she, she's one of the few people who make those connections between, you know, the politics, but also the intellectual uh, uh, work. Um, so I, I admire both. Excellent. So I guess now we begin with the Q&A. Yeah, I'm going to just uh, try to unmute people one by one. The first com one comes from Faisal. Faisal, are you there? Yeah. Hello. Hi. We can hear you. If you can ask your question, that'd be great. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Faisal from uh, Kashmir, Indian Administration, Kashmir Occupation. Uh, so I, want, I want to ask a comment from you. Is it just me? I'm hearing Nico. No, no, no. I, I'm going to ask the question. The question that he wrote was, um, I thought to ask about Kashmir as we are a colonized state, want to tell you how right wing and uh, how the right wing in India is creating fear by depressing minorities. I, Okay, we're going to move on to the second one, and then maybe we'll come back. So, Usman? Hello, yes, yeah, sorry. Um, so, uh, thank you for the talk. I wanted to push you a little bit, for, ask you a bit more about, because um, obviously we've talked, a, we've mentioned things like Islamophobia and so on, and obviously there's a specific Western discourse of Islamophobia, but as we've all seen, there's also an Arab one. There's, uh, specifically in the Syrian context, there's always been a Syrian one. Right. And it seems to obviously have evolved because, of course, you had this narrative of Assad versus ISIS. But, but even before that, as soon as it, the revolution started in Syria, you could see them rolling out kind of Islamophobic discourse. Right. So you had certain areas where, you know, they had certain language they would use. And I'm just wondering if you could talk a little bit about these internal dynamics and then how it might intersect with the international one. Yeah, thank you. That's that's an excellent uh, point. Islamophobia. The Syrian regime used uh, uh, Islamophobia against uh, revolutionary forces, and it was very convenient. Uh, the Syrian regime presented it itself as um, feminist and secular, and against uh, extremists and against uh, um, you know any uh, any Muslims as uh, portray any Muslims as as radicals. 
And what's interesting is that uh, you see in, in the ways that uh, radical fascistic right wing, uh, radical uh, right wing uh, forces allied themselves with uh, the Syrian regime. I mean, if you go to some fascist uh, website in Europe, oftentimes you see um, T-shirts with the Syrian flag or with helicopters dropping barrel bombs or um, even in Italy, the fascist uh, movement in Italy, at some point they had uh, a flag of, uh, of uh, the Syrian, um, uh, of Syria, because they support the Islamophobia of the Syrian regime. And they want to bring some of that to, to Europe. And even their discourses, oftentimes they see, they say, we need to learn from the Syrian regime and the way that the Syrian regime handled extremism and Al Qaeda and ISIS in, in Syria. So there are very organic and important connections between far right in Europe and in the West in general and the Syrian regime. And the Syrian regime used that very strategically. I mean, it's interesting to see how the Syrian regime portrayed itself as feminist as it kills and tortures and rapes countless number of women in Syrian prisons uh, and starve them to death in, in different cities and neighborhoods. And yet they are feminist. Um, I'm not sure what the logic is, but people buy it, unfortunately. Great. Um, we have a question from Shahad. Hello, Dr. Manif. Thank you for the book, uh, the great book. And thank you for today. Um, I would like to ask about the, um, when I read your book, um, um, I stopped at the notion of uh, the state of exception and um, how you used it there. And I would like to know, um, if the technologies of violence and the practices of violence um, in Syria was under the notion or the concept of the state of exception, or um, we can't call it a state of exception because it was um, in a way uh, institutionalized eventually and um, a, um, it took place within the um, legal uh, system. So I would like you to to explain this for me, please. Yeah, I mean, that's, thank that's great. yeah, thank you. Thank you for your question. I mean, that's a, a really important question because the Syrian regime, that's one of the pillars of the Syrian regime. There was a state of exception um, in, in Syria since 1963. And uh, the Syrian regime has always used it uh, as a pretext to prevent uh, the emergence of political parties, as, the, as a way to prevent the emergence of political spaces. Uh, because we are at war with, with Israel uh, and therefore, or, um, you know, at different times, different things. Uh, at some point, uh, there was a war against uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. Therefore, we cannot be completely um, open to the democratic process. So I would say that the state of exception is um, one of the pillars uh, that the Syrian regime has utilized. And it's not necessarily unique to, to Syria, but I think we have to understand the specificity of the Syrian uh, brand of, of exception. And I tried to do that in, uh, in the book. It's one of the tools of, uh, of violence or the technologies of violence that the Syrian regime uses. It's not the only one, but it's a very powerful one. And uh, one of the things that protesters uh, were shunting, that protesters were shunting when the revolution started was the end of the state of, uh, of exception. And uh, after a few months, the Syrian regime uh, repealed the 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 the, uh, the state of exception and put uh, the um, a new law about terrorism in in place, uh, which was basically uh, a copy of of uh, the old uh, law. So we are still in a state of exception in in Syria, um, where everything is permissible for for the state because we are at war with with Israel. That's the the pretext, but. Um, uh, and it's powerful, um, and um, uh, you see it in a number of different places. But I think in, in Syria, it's um, it's the most like, extreme uh, manifestation of of that. Great. I think we're going to probably end on this last question, which I think is apropos. Harar. Yes. Hi. Uh, uh, I'd like to ask Yasser about. Uh, uh, Abdul Rahman Munif, what he would have thought if he was here with us now uh, about the Arab Spring? Thank you. It's uh, it's hard to tell, uh, but I think um, in his writing he was always um, uh, 
on the side of the oppressed, the wretched, uh, the working classes, the peasants, um, the rural, um, uh, you know, uh, rural populations, and and so on. And so I think he would have a complex understanding of the Arab revolts, but at the same time, um, try to complicate, you know, the the picture. Um, it's, you know, I, I think it's it's difficult to uh, have one stance about the entire Arab world, um, but I think in general he would support the spirit of uh, the Arab revolution. Um, would be very critical, as we all are, uh, of certain revolutionary practices or tendencies or political groups uh, or alliances. But I think that he would be 100% uh, for the end of the state of dictatorship and authoritarian rule in the Arab world. Um, that's messy, it's violent, as we saw. Um, sometimes it leads to civil wars, uh, but there is no beginning or a new beginning without getting rid of Arab dictators. Thank you for your question and thank you for attending, Rai. Very good friend. Okay, um, I think we have one minute left. Uh, Radwan, if you want to ask your final question and then we'll wrap up. Yes, sir. Yeah, yes, sir. It's been like, what, 22 years since we have met, right? And uh, for those who doesn't know, yes, sir, and I come a long way, you know, from 22 years ago. Uh, Yasser and I were on the far sides of the spectrum at one point in time. I was on the far right, Yasser was on the far left, and we've had our funny agreements or disagreements, or mostly it was disagreements at the point. It was very interesting, enriching, I would say, at that time. Now, after that, uh, you know, we, we, uh, we went apart. I traveled to Montreal, Yasser went to uh, the US. Then I mostly came towards what Yasser thinks, which is towards the left side of the spectrum. But now my question is really, after all those years, after all those experiences that we've been through really, yes, sir, do you, do you firmly believe, being, have, having lived for so long in the West, do you believe that another world is possible? Do you believe that another Middle East is possible? And away from all these myths that were, were put in our mind, the asatir, the, the uh, عشنا فيها يعني حقيقة لو لو بينا بالمدد الإيس لو أنا وأنت بينا بالمدد الإيس would have probably stayed the same people اللي كناها أيام الجامعة and probably would it even have changed uh, do you think that another Middle East is possible given not, that not everyone is capable of leaving the Middle East and having the exposure that we've had you know I think that there is no going back to um, the Arab world pre-2011 uh, I think that the Arab, the, the icon of the Arab dictators um, is, you know, ha has been destroyed. Um, so the question is, is it possible to build, you know, another world? I think we should act as if it was possible. Uh, then if, you know, if we end there, that's, that's great, but there is no, um, you know, uh, assurance policy. There is no guarantee that we, we get there, but we have to act as if it was possible. Um, that's that's my beliefs um, because dictatorship is ob obviously not an option. And thank you. And it was a pleasure to be your um, your opponent uh, back then uh, and friends today. And Ziad, great. And um, we've just hit the hour. So um, yes, yeah, so thank you so much for joining, Malik. Thank you so much for uh, hosting. It was a real pleasure to be able to hear your. Uh, Talk, hear you talk about your work and your perspective. For all of you on the call, um, I listed a link in the chat with our feedback form. Please fill it out. It's just one question. Was this good? Uh, this will show up on our YouTube page and our podcast next week. If you'd like to support this work, go to afikra.com slash support and find how you can contribute to this, um, this work and keep our work going and growing. And with that, I will see you next week. We have an event this Saturday with the Shabak Festival. It should be really, really good. Uh, Malik, thanks so much. And Yasser, thanks so much. Thank you very much. Thank you all. Um, Thank you. It was really a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. Thank you, Mikey. Thank you, Yasser. Thank you, Malik.